And this is a monthly trends analysis that looks at the major forces reshaping higher education technology as we know it. If you haven't seen it, go to ftte.us where you can download some sample issues and if you like, subscribe. Now, the forum and the FTTE report are both part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. Now, this is a multimedia, participatory, ongoing, and open attempt to struggle with the future of education and technology. This includes the forum. This includes the FTTE report. It also includes a blog. It includes a bookstore. It includes a book club and a podcast coming up soon. If you haven't seen that, go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, we can only do all this work with the help of some very generous supporters, and we'd like to thank them before we proceed. So to begin with, we have the NYSERNET group in New York State, which does a fantastic job of connecting that state's colleges and universities to the broadband internet. They do wonderful professional development work. They do great projects, great analysis. We're delighted at their work, and we're really pleased at their support. We're also really grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So let me, pres let me explain how this works. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, where I am right now, and where the slide is just for a minute, is called the stage. And it's called that because everyone involved in this conversation can see and hear everything that goes on on the stage. This is where our guest will be, and this is where you can be, and I'll show you how. If you look down below it, you can see dozens of people around you, each of them represented by an icon. And that icon might be a silhouette, it might be a static photograph, or it might be a video feed. That usually represents one person, but it could be several more sending it from the same location. And if you'd like to chat with one of those people, simply double click on them. And if their technology is turned on and they want to chat with you, your two icons will click together like Legos. And you can have your own private audiovisual bubble, which is pretty neat. But I said this is a conversational platform and we can have conversations all together. And there are three different tools involved in letting that happen. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see running across it a white strip. And the left edge of that is the first of three important buttons. That button on the left edge has a number, uh, 37, not 38, and a little picture of human faces or heads. If you click on that, two windows will pop up. The one on the left will give you a kind of film strip overview of everybody who is here. So you can mouse over them and learn a bit more uh, about each individual. On the right is a chat box. And that's a great informal spot for people to share their thoughts, their questions. We often find people will uh, toss out ideas they're just starting to form up or they'll share links to web resources as we go. So that chat box is one really uh, popular and easy way to participate. Now back to that white strip. Next to the number, which is now 42, you'll see a question mark with a circle around it. That's a good place to go if you'd like to quickly ask a question or share a comment. If your camera doesn't work or you're not in a position where you can talk out loud on video, just click that. Up will pop a little box, lets you type in your question or a comment, type that in, press send, I'll add it to my list, and when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen for everyone to see, and then I'll read it out loud for everyone to hear. Now, if your camera and microphone are working and you're in a place like I am right now where you can speak freely, go back to that white strip. Next to the question mark, you'll see a raised hand icon. Click that and that tells us you want to join us up here on stage. In fact, we can have up to four different people here at one time. So between me and the guest and one of you, we can have a conversation flowing right away. In fact, we have two of you. Think of it as a kind of pop-up DIY panel conversation. So. That white strip has three of your excellent easy keys to participation. If that's not enough, if you're a Twitter user, just head over to Twitter and use the hashtag FTTE. And I'll be scanning that throughout our conversation. And that's a place where people often like to share thoughts and ideas that have come up during the conversation. And we'll see people who, usually for bandwidth reasons, can't get in on the call, and they'll often send questions there as well. So. All of these are ways to have conversation. All of these are methods for us to exchange our ideas. And we are really grateful to Shindig for making available the technology to let us do that. Now, we're also grateful to one other source, and we want to thank our supporters on Patreon. If you haven't seen Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter or GoFundMe, and it's a way for people to collaboratively fund someone who is making something that they deem important. In that case, it's us making the Future of Education Observatory.
So if you click on patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, you'll see ways that you can contribute as little as a dollar a month to keep all the lights on, the machines humming. You'll see from this uh, slide, these are the people who contribute even more. And we're really grateful to Robin DeVries. We're grateful to Colleen Carmine, Kristen Eshelman, Bob Johnson, Corey S., all kinds of awesome people. We're really grateful to the 110 plus who support us there. Thank you very much. So that's who supports this. That's how the technology works. And now you can see the ideas that we like have behind us. What we'd like to do is welcome this week's guest. I'm very, very honored uh, to welcome Kevin Guthrie. Kevin is the president of Ithaca, which is an extraordinary group that manages a whole series of services, does terrific research. JSTOR is just one of their services. Kevin has been one of the most influential, provocative, experienced, and thoughtful people in the entire world of higher education. Um, I've, I've followed his career for a long time. I've had great conversations with him, and I'm delighted to welcome him here to the forum. Kevin, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Brian. I'm happy to be here. And, uh, you know, all goes back to you, too. I mean, uh, we've worked together in different ways over many years back in the nightly days. And uh, you've, you've made a huge impact uh, in, in so many different areas and just enjoy continuing to work with you. So thanks for having me on. Oh, well, that's really kind of you to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, speaking of Knightley, we have a former director of Knightley, Joellen Parker in the audience, another hero of mine and a great friend. So, Kevin, I always begin these conversations by asking the guest what you're up to in the next year. What kind of projects and issues are going to be focusing most of your attention for uh, the rest of 2019? Well, I think, um, you know, for those of you who are <clears throat> uh, not deeply familiar with Ithaca, um, JSTOR is the primary service that we offer, the, the academic journals database, historically an academic journals database, which, you know, started up in 1995. So uh, mm. it has uh, over over that period of time um, but the way that the pace of the world is changing there are some big changes that we have to contemplate so there's, there's a fair amount of work that we're doing at Ithaca supporting Ithaca and it, uh, JSTOR in the in the change that it's making to the way it delivers on on its mission um, mm. one of the things sort of more broadly with Ithaca uh, in in looking out at the future and 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 I, I commented on this a bit in this in this paper uh, Brian that you you sent out is uh, is the is you know the big data question and how how data are impacting our education in a lot of different ways. So I, I've been spending a lot of time really trying to grapple with what are the nature of those challenges that are coming from the move toward big data, machine learning, uh, AI, et cetera. What, what's that going to mean five, ten years from now? How do colleges and universities have to change or adapt, or what kind of pressures are they going to feel? Uh, and and trying to think about are there ways to help um, uh, higher education manage that that process, that transition. Uh, it, this feels to me in some sense familiar or in parallel with some of the changes that we felt uh, coming uh, with when content was moving from print to digital. Uh, so, so trying to think about that, trying to be a, a little bit ahead of that. And, you know, that's obviously a, a big issue everybody's thinking about. I'm just, I'm just one in the, in the crowd. Well, one uh, outstanding member of the crowd. Um, Kevin, uh, you wrote a piece which uh, I've been sharing broadly, um, which is really, really important, uh, called Challenges to Higher Education as Most Essential Purposes. Uh, and I have yet to find a piece that is both so bleeding edge, uh, but also crams so many important issues in one spot uh, so accessibly and so concisely. I think it's just a kind of blueprint for uh, maybe a scary roadmap for every institution in, in higher education to think about going forward. Um, let me ask, what are, before we dive into the piece itself, what are what is some of the feedback that you've gotten from people? I mean, uh, uh, have people found you to be too optimistic? Have they uh, taken issue with key points? I mean, what's the audience been like? Well, I think, you know, I think the the, the piece is really a framework. Uh, I mean, I think that's what I set out to do is, is to sort of try to lay out what were some of the areas and to have some kind of a framework for thinking about these. Because I think as we sort of look at the future, we can quickly become overwhelmed by the many different areas that are, yeah. that are whether, whether, whether you're a college or a university or you're JSTOR or your Ithaca or whatever kind of in entity you might be, you can quickly be overwhelmed by, 
by the feeling that things are hitting you at from from lots of different areas. And you know, I do want to I do want to pay pay respects to to Bill Bowen who who was my mentor for for many many years. I mean, I I I can't even say my mentor. He's like everybody's mentor. There's so many people yes. who who benefited from from working with him. But I was I was fortunate to work with him very closely. And you know, I, I was doing I, I don't remember exactly. I was trying to think about how to frame the problems for Ithaca, right? How do how how can we think about what's coming? And I kind of reached back to this old paper that Bill wrote um, in 2000, which was which had so many prescient things in it, but it it talked about the basic principles of of values for higher education, and it mm. in such a nice succinct uh, framework. And so I I took that that paper and said, okay, let me think about those those values, those principles that he had he had outlined in 2000. And, and apply them to today and say, let's think about what are the issues in each of these areas? So it's it's really more of a kind of a roadmap uh, laying out things. So in terms of people's responses, I think I've, I've been, you know, I've been pleased that people uh, have, have felt it was a helpful structuring document. And, you know, at least for us internally, it's, it's allowed us to say, okay, we're going to ignore these areas and focus on these other ones for now. Uh, a little bit of a focusing opportunity for us. Uh, so I, I think a lot of people have reacted to it in different different ways, but I, I try not to take too much of a prescriptive approach uh, with it. So I haven't I haven't received much quote unquote criticism, or it mm -hmm. hasn't been uh, I don't think seen as as terribly provocative. Well, it's um, it's a really powerful piece, and uh, I commend this to everybody. Uh, and just to, just to uh, recap. Um, uh, the great uh, late Bill Bowen uh, saw that uh, education serves uh, what he deemed as five major purposes, having educating students to lead productive lives, conducting research while creating new knowledge, uh, serving as engines of opportunity, social mobility, protecting and supporting diverse points of view, and defending important values. And that's almost 20 years old, and I don't see a change to that yet. Um, that's a really, really important set, I think. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think I, I think when you when you think about those things, in some ways, more recently, they're under more assault um, than they were uh, in clearly in two thousand. I mean, I think he anticipated that to a great degree, but the the kinds of things that are happening or have happened in each of those areas uh, have made it more challenging, um, made it more challenging economically, politically, uh, in terms of culture uh, at institutions. So I think. And that's what I mean by it being a framework, you know, so you can look at something and say, okay, well, what's changed or what's impact, you know, what's accelerating in terms of change now? How do we, how do we address it? How are we going to have a, a set of issues around it? So I think it just highlights uh, some of the, some of the problem areas as it were that we're, yeah. that we're facing right now. Friends, I have all kinds of questions I want to badger uh, our poor guest with, um, but I would like to um, just put this uh, out for you right now to return to that strip of white in the bottom of the screen those three great buttons, uh, especially to click your hand to join us on stage. In fact, if clicking that button is too much, let me just add a, uh, a nice widget here. You should see uh, alongside us now a little uh, teal colored podium. So if you'd like to join us here to ask a question in a video, just click on that and that'll throw you up right up on stage. Um, and if you have questions that, if you can't do that because you don't have a camera or a microphone or your bandwidth isn't quite great, just please click the uh, raised hand um, or click the question mark and I'll be happy to relay your question as we go. Um, I, let me just start off by uh, noticing one theme that's uh, very dear to my, uh, my work uh, as well. Um, running through all those different challenges was the transformation of the population. You, you know, demographics several times, both the changing uh, mixture of the American population, as well as the aging of our population and the shrinkage in some cases. Um, why don't we start off with that? I mean, what, what, what are the major demographic challenges that uh, are really pressing on American higher education? Well, I, you know, I think this is, you know, if you're, if you're on this, if you're, if you're, if you're one of these little faces down here uh, below the bottom, you probably have heard a lot about this and, and know about this. So I won't, I won't belabor it, but, but obviously some demographic changes in the 18 to 22 year old population are expected um, in the Northeast. And we're seeing among the sm small colleges, uh, struggles to maintain enrollments um, in in that in that context, uh, and so you then have so that's one just the the, the big number actually of, of that age students and the demographics associated with that creates a challenge. Uh, 
we obviously have a changing population and types of students uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of their backgrounds, uh, uh, in a whole range of different dimensions. And I think, frankly, um, uh, many of us feel like a combination of the increasing um, demands, both at the level of your career or job coming into college and university and the nature of the work that a lot of people have to do at the college university level, as compared to the rate at which, you know, sort of our broad-based K-12 to education system has advanced maybe more slowly. So you're seeing a bigger gap between what's mm -hmm. demanded that, at that higher level and how well-prepared students come in, in general. And then when you start talking about underrepresented uh, populations or populations that are coming from low socioeconomic environments, their preparation is even uh, uh, worse, if you will. And so mm -hmm. the gap they have to overcome to succeed at the, at the post-secondary level is, is greater. So, you, you know, that creates a real challenge for universities and colleges, which is, which is fairly obvious, right? You, you've got this changing population. From a mission point of view, you, you want to continue to be an engine of social mobility. So you want to bring in more low SES or, 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 or underrepresented or first generation families in. They're less well prepared. They have less money. So they are both, if you will, quote unquote, more, more costly to educate because you have to provide more support and more, uh, more assistance in some respect. And they, they can't pay, quote unquote, full price or they pay less. Right. So, so when you, when you want to fulfill mission at these colleges and universities, it's more expensive to do so. So I, I think that that's, um, that's you know, in a, in a, in a nutshell, uh, okay. one of the, the, the big challenges. Um, Think, no, lead, please. So I, yeah, I'll stop. No, I have one other thought, but I'll, I'll stop and let you. Uh, this is this is a huge problem. I mean, not only are these populations more important to educate, but they're more expensive, which adds pressure to the already increasingly powerful narrative that higher education in the U.S. is uh, is too expensive. We have one way of addressing that, um, and, and it's come up. Um, but before we get to that, we have Joellen Parker joining us. Hello, Joellen. I'm I think you're muted. I'm clicking around madly. I'm clicking around madly. And, uh, and you're perfect. Myself up here. Welcome, welcome, Joel. Uh, can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Yep. I did not mean to join the podium. I was exploring the features of this new tool, and I clicked in the wrong box. But <laughs> it feels very right to be with the two of you again. Well, it's, it's great to see you. It's great to see you, Joel, and, and welcome to your new position at CIC. Um, Thank you. Did you, I, I, I have to ask, Joellen, you, you've been working for so much of your life with small colleges all over the U.S. I mean, which of these challenges that uh, Kevin has outlined really hit the small American college more than anything else? I would add to what Kevin has said. Um, I think they all hit the small American college. I hmm. think the question is, who do they hit in terms of the various important constituencies, boards, administrators, faculties, and how do those constituencies understand those problems? And therefore, how well can they plan for them, talk about them, analyze them in a spirit of shared governance? Governance is very difficult. Uh, Kevin, uh, you're you're evoking Bill Bowen. Uh, one of his last works was about the changes in university governance. You know, looking ahead five to 10 years, what kind of transformations of governance do you anticipate happening? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that, so there's, there's different, there's different um, forms of governance, right? I mean, so, so one of the issues is, is at the trustee level and the interaction between the trustee and the trustees in the institution. And the other one is faculty shared governance, um, an incredibly important issue for, for colleges and universities. Uh, and, and, you know, those two areas sometimes uh, for some people feel like they come into conflict. Uh, the, the roles of trustees in the long-term uh, uh, success of a, of a college or university and the role of, of faculty in, in, that, in that same uh, endeavor. And I think, you know, that, that I think finding uh, better ways for the, the faculty interests and the institutional trustee interest to be brought into alignment 
uh, when sometimes they can feel like they're not in alignment or, you know, what, what the, uh, uh, Tobin and Tobin sort of identified in their books was this sort of notion of not shared governance, in fact, kind of um, uh, distributed governance. You know, you've got responsibility for that part, we got to be responsibility for the other part. never come over into our territory. You, you got your territory, we got ours. And, and, and have it framed that way as opposed to uh, developing a deeper sense of the importance of the institution and trade offs and compromises that may need to be made in terms of you know, assets, resources, et cetera. So I, I think I have the, you know, I'm not an expert on governance, um, but, but, and, and uh, college and university governance, but I, I think that it, that bridge between the uh, fact and governance principles and possibilities of, for trustees in the long term uh, uh, viability and sustainability of the overall enterprise is where the real, you know, the real engagement, real rubber meets the road. Well, thank you. Uh, that's a really detailed answer. Um, the uh, thank you, Joelle, for the uh, for appearing. Um, that's wonderful to see you. Um, and this is just one sign of how powerful this article is. Uh, let me let me just dive into uh, another angle. Uh, we have a question that came up um, from uh, Mary Beth Shea, uh, who asks, as one part of this, how do we address the approximately seventy percent condition of contingent faculty? How do we understand that? I'm going to flash that on the screen again so people can see that. So, referring to the uh, adjunctification of the American professoriate, I mean, on the one hand, that helps control costs. On the other hand, it's a humanitarian disaster. Yeah, so, I mean, I think um, that uh, the, the, the challenge there, and, and again, I have to kind of uh, attribute you know, this to Bill and some of the work that he did. One of the, one of the things, you know, that there are the economics that exist. And so uh, the, the institutions need to respond to those economics. And, uh, but I think that uh, what, what was missing is in the sort of response reaction that has created the adjunctification, if you will, is the recognition of the of the importance of the teaching role as a professional activity, and I'm going to focus on the teaching side of this as opposed to some you know research positions. That 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 um, there should be a recognized professional, uh, fully employed, uh, fully benefits oriented, fully appreciated part of the profession right. who are teachers and what they need in terms of being great faculty teachers. And I think that, you know, the sort of having it be, uh, you know, as you say, contingent uh, contractor type uh, uh, faculty slash employees is, um, ha has been, uh, you know, obviously, um, uh, uh, you know, a situation that is, as you say, uh, uh, not fair to those who are playing that role. Um, and I think, you know, that the responsibility for that has to be borne across the institution. I mean, even by the faculty, right? Because the tenured faculty and leading the departments have played a big role in, 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 in creating the, the, the adjunctification. It's not just administration. So I think those are, those are just challenges that have been, have been faced. And I think what Bill argued for was, was um, a, a better recognition of that role and uh, a lifting up of that from a professional point of view. Now, of course, that would cost more. And so the universities right. and colleges would have to figure out a way to, to pay for that uh, over over a longer term. So, but I think you have to recognize, um, you know, first the importance of that of, of that teaching role, and not not consider it a diminished aspect of what uh, what's being delivered. Is uh, th this is a question that uh, uh, Steve Ehrman asked um, by email, and I, I just want to grab the question and twist it a little bit. Um, his general question was, are there any institutions that are really taking an impressive strategic approach to addressing these challenges? And let me just tweak that to say, are there any institutions you find that are doing a good job of addressing the uh, adjunct crisis? Um, I mean, you, you know, yeah. doing what you say, uh, treating them more professionally. Yeah, even even in the even in the the response to the question I just gave, uh, I, I was feeling about halfway through like, you know, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to share what I what I've learned, and you know, at some level, I was trying to channel something written by Bill. Uh, I don't really have 
I don't really, that's not, not the area of, of where I, I've spent, you know, a lot of my career I can observe. And, and basically I'm just like one of the guys, one of the folks, men and women in this, uh, this list of, of pictures here with a perspective on that issue. I don't, I don't really have uh, much more. Than that. Understood. Um, uh, and we'll return to Steve's question in a bit, um, the general purpose of the question. In fact, Steve just brought himself on. Let's see if we can, uh, Steve, greetings. Let's see if his connection is live. Take a second here for a connection from, I think, California to uh, connect. I need a drum roll. Steve, um, can you hear us and see us? Yeah, you're fine. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Right? Now we can. Good to see you. Nice to see you too, both of you. Um, Kevin has, in, has described a number of problems that higher education is facing. I'm particularly interested in the ones under the first heading about students making academic progress. I'm wondering uh, if you have a sense, which of these problems are the most wicked, um, hard to frame, really against the odds of being able to solve, and which ones seem more likely to be um, adequately dealt with? You know, we'll muddle through on that one most likely. Uh, can you rank them that way for the ones that were where higher ed is most likely at many institutions to muddle through versus those that, well, I think this may, this issue is framed maybe insoluble for the time being. We aren't going to make much progress there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah, for those of you, who, I, I kind of have the paper in front of me. So I'll, I'll so that the items that are identified in that section were, um, uh, the unsust unsustainable cost of the traditional modes of instruction, you know, the eight to one faculty ratio or whatever you might want to call it. The next one was the changing right. population, which we talked a little bit about. The next one was the development of educational technologies and, um, you know, various kinds of uh, adaptive learning. The next is balancing the curriculum. Uh, the next is sort of figuring out whether the institution is going to get unbundled around three components, uh, 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 education, credentialing, or selection. And the last one is just the arms race around a residential experience. So those are the, those are the ones that, that, were talked to, that, that were highlighted in that particular section. The first thing I'll say is that I think that balancing the curriculum is a challenge, but faculty do that. They've done it for 100 years, maybe a little slower than you'd like. I, I think that will, that will happen. And you, you know, I think the tough balance there is between, you know, so-called practical kinds of things like responding to the need for computer science or more, uh, more quote unquote practical, uh, uh majors versus the humanities. Um, sure. that's something that's going to, going to be wrestled with over time. But I do think that will, I think that will be challenging, but I think we've higher education has dealt with those challenges for a long time. Uh, I think that, um, educational technologies is a really interesting one. Um, I think there, there's a kind of a, a need to sort of look for higher education to look deeply at itself. We, we've done a couple of a big uh, a, a, at Ithaca SNR. We, we've done a couple of big studies uh, where we've done our, uh, randomized control trials to where we've, we've put an adaptive learning instruction uh, set of tools in the hands of, of, of departments, faculty, et cetera, and statistics across a broad range of institutions. And we've done this twice in major projects. And it's the, it's the administrative day-to-day -day stuff that is preventing it from going forward. It's not, it's mm. not the technology as much as it is, you know, the times that the classes meet or the, the faculty involved or coming back to this question of adjuntification, you know, a faculty yeah. member gets assigned two weeks before the course and how can they possibly deploy a different way of, of instructing than they've ever done before? They, they don't have the time or resources. So, you know, we found that, it, it, it requires such a change in the environment, uh, how the classes are taught, what kind of space they use, who the faculty are, who the deans are, who the leaders are, how do you get the word out, all, all kind of basic like leadership change management kinds of things that any institution would have that are really conspiring to make it very difficult for the uh, technology to be used to do more quote unquote productive uh, instruction. So I, I, I see that as a kind of an interesting one where I, I, I do think that there's great potential there. And I don't think it's, I don't, you know, a lot of people would like to say, oh, well, you know, faculty don't want to deploy this because it's going to 
mean fewer jobs. I, I don't think it's that. I, I think that there's a way of doing the work and there's a lot of apparatus around doing the work and, and doing it in this different way is very contra to that apparatus. And so uh, I think that's, that's something that's going to be very difficult to move forward. And I think it's terribly important for it to move forward because I think it really is a, it's going to be a huge factor in the ability to teach more students. And that there I, I, I turn to this question of demographics. I think that the demographics are so often presented only in the light that we presented it initially as a challenge, as a costly, difficult thing. Uh -huh. If we can figure out a way to teach more students, we all know there are way more students today than there were ever before in the sense that people needing retraining, people wanting retraining, people willing to go to the web to learn new things. If we could do that from our in higher education institutions at scale, at reasonable fees, it, it's arguably there's a much bigger market of, of students and of learning if we, we think about packaging that in a different way. So I, I think... There is huge opportunity there, but it's it's connected to breaking some of these um, some of the, some of the apparatus that's been that's been set up. Um, so you know, I think that connects in both to the first two items: the the mm -hmm. unsustainable cost of, of of traditional teaching methods and and our and our changing population. Um, the the last area I would highlight um, in, in the area of unbundling and rebundling. Um, you know, I, I do think it's, you know, it's it, that I think is probably not going to not going to change in a sense that um, colleges and universities are going to continue uh, for at least I, what I can see in the foreseeable future, bundling these some part education, some part certification and some part selection. I mean, uh, whether it's graduate schools or professional places, they just rely on, on these institutions to help them find great people. And I think they will continue to do that. Although I think it's, you know, I think it's an area that's that's always going to be at risk. But I think it's it's an area where uh, higher education has such a strong uh, a, a position over time. So that, I that guess that's how I would kind of rank them. I, I think the greatest opportunity is is trying to break some of these um, existing um, the existing apparatus and doing uh, being able to be more effective at using the technologies where where they make sense. Thank you. Steve, what a fantastic question. Um, and uh, Kevin, what a rich, rich answer. Uh, friends, you can see just how many issues are crammed into this, uh, into this paper uh, and how many issues that uh, are in play uh, trying to understand where higher education is headed. Um, we have more questions in the pipeline and uh, please uh, feel free to uh, either click the podium to uh, join us on stage or click the raised hand button to tell me that you want to join us. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Charles Findlay at Northeastern who asks, what makes higher education as an institution and the five purposes identified unique that cannot and are not being met by other institutions in our society today? Wow, that's a great question. It is. Um, sounds like a, it sounds, sounds like a, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I would like to ask you to help answer it um, afterwards because I, I, I'm betting you have a have an answer. Um, you know, I think part of it's the not for profit status. I think part of it. I mean, that's just the simplest. I think the part of it is just the history and the richness of the history over mm. so, so much time. Um, I think part of it is is this sort of fundamental commitment to the advancement of knowledge that these institutions have shared as a community. And um and, and that sort of rich, deep understanding that evidence matters and that building on past evidence is important. Um, so I think there are these, these long, you know, centuries old principles that have dominated this particular uh, environment, I, I think is, you know, it's unique. I mean, there, there really isn't a, a, a kind of community of institutions that, that share so strongly that kind of, uh, that, that kind of history and and commitment. I think, um, you know, I, I and I and I think that, frankly, there there been a, you know, this is one of the challenges when you get into an environment where the resources get, uh, you know, get tighter and tighter, and you have to figure out a way to fund yourself. Then you have a tendency to, or it becomes harder and harder to stick to principles and stick to core values. I mean, we've seen some of that in the media, as an example, right? I mean, the, 
the changing economics and 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 media dissemination of media has has changed. It looks like the value system of a lot of, of our of our media, and um, you you don't you know. And I know that there are some critics of higher ed who, who feel like it's overly commercialized and has started down that pathway. But but I think it's it's history and it's it's leadership and it's culture and its values are so deep. Uh, I would say that it is it is unique in protecting. Uh, these types of values, at least in our society over the last, whatever, uh, some number of centuries. Um, so, you know, one hopes that, uh, that, 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 that tradition can, can create enough inertia and momentum to keep us in that, in that space. Well, thank you. That's a, a really rich question. Um, uh, and, uh, thank you, Kevin, for, uh, cutting across it. That may help reveal some points of, uh, emerging competition for higher education as well. Um, uh, speaking of which, we have another question from uh, Professor Jeff Ritter. Let me bring that up on stage here, or on the screen. Uh, Jeff asks, what role do you think non-credit, non-accredited learning experiences like coding boot camps are playing in the failure of four-year colleges? Do you think non-technical skills, soft skills, and knowledge of a title might be taught in those areas as well? So the competition from boot camps, et cetera. Yeah. I, you know, I think I, I'm not... I'm, it would be, you know, I think I'm not close enough to the front edge to really answer that question. I'll just give my instinct from a, from a distance, um, is that I think in the first phase of those boot camps, I, I think they've been more, for lack of a better, this is not the right word, parasitic on the community, on the, you know, they require, the, many of them add a skill to already somebody who's been educated. I mean, we, that's, that's a, a rank over generalization but uh, the boot uh, you know a good number of the boot camps that have that have been most prominent and successful have added a technical skill to somebody with a liberal arts degree or a different kind of degree and they've then been able to leverage that into a, a better salaried position so i don't i don't my gut instinct is that so far they haven't been seen as competitors or substitutes for uh for a four-year college education um I, that's that's what it looks like to me. But but people who are on this group or elsewhere who are you know in there fighting for enrollments um, may or may not be hearing from people. Hey, I don't have to come because I'm just going to go do this six month boot camp and I'm going to get a 100k job as a product manager or developer or something like that. Uh, I, I don't have the sense that that's that that's yet to that point. Um, but I do think that I, I do think that I, I just think the much bigger factor is the is this is the price. Um, that, that people, that it's gotten to a level that people are saying, I don't know that I can afford this. And is there another alternative? And I'm going to pursue some other alternative. And, um, I, I think that's whether, whether that's, whether they're, uh, misguided because the, the investment is worth it or not is a separate question. There's a perception and it's, it, it is a lot of, uh, of money at different, you know, depending on the institution. Um, but that's my, that's my, that's my gut, uh, from what I've been able to discern. Uh, I don't think that it's necessarily always going to be that way. Um, but you know, as I was saying earlier, that's, that's really the crux of the unbundling question is whether, you know, that, that, you know, that selection process, for example, combined with the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a sort of mini bundle, right? Where somebody comes in and says, I, I need somebody who could be, a developer in XYZ. I don't care if they have a liberal arts degree or not. Um, right. I just need them to have this set of skills. And if 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 XYZ boot camp, uh, General Catalyst can like come in and say, okay, w you know, General Assembly, excuse me, can come in and say they've got these credentials. And if if it's, if companies will hire, th then it will do what you're describing. But I haven't I haven't seen that, at least in my experience, at scale. Not yet. Um we have, uh, thank you. Um, that's a probing question, again, about competition uh, for higher education. Um, related to this, uh, we have a question from um, the excellent Phil Katz, longtime friend of the program, who couldn't make it today, but he wanted me to relay this. Um, he says, recently, the historian John Fee wrote about the accelerating shift of resources from the liberal arts to vocational and professional fields especially at small non or excuse me, especially at small colleges. He suggested that many liberal arts colleges have effectively given up on the intellectual and moral formation of undergraduates. 
Do you think that forming values through liberal arts is still a significant function for colleges moving forward? Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, I'm, I, I have the good fortune, I'm on the board of the National Humanities Center. Um, I myself was an engineer as an undergraduate, but, uh, but basically spent uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of time with a lot of people in the humanities, the Mellon Foundation and other places. So I'm a, I'm a huge uh, proponent of the importance of, of the liberal arts. And I, 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 the value is only going to keep going up in, in an environment where we have machine learning and AI and all that. The importance of the humanities questions that come around that, ethical questions, et cetera, and a deep understanding of values. Geez, we, 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 we see it every day in what we're, what we're ha struggling with um, uh, in, in the world today. So I, I think it's incredibly important. Now, having said that, do you have a situation where the quote unquote customers are demanding these technical skills because they play a role in, in, in their ability to get jobs. Yeah. And you can't really blame them for that. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, this, this does present a really challenging problem. I mean, you take, uh, you know, many, many colleges. I know, I know some ones I've been involved with the, the shift from major the, the distribution of majors in a very short period of time you know computer science major going from uh 25 people to you know 400 in a matter of four or five years and becoming the biggest major at a college or a university it's happening all over the place and and so a college can't just ignore that it has to respond to the desire for the students to have that um right. so i do think that you know i'd love to be able to give a, an easy answer to that i think uh, when you go back to, that's why I think it is so important to emphasize the values and the, the historical importance of those values so that we can try to retain resources for that. But, you know, with the, you know, with the, the reduction in, in funding coming from the public sector, um, it, 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 it does make it uh, more and more challenging. And I, I hope that we can uh, continue to, to put money in where our values are uh, over over time. But I don't have a you know, I think we just have to keep making that case. I don't have an easy Thank solution you. for it. Thank you. That's a great question and a, a really great, passionate, yet practical answer. Um, we have uh, uh, two people who just joined us at the same time. Um, so let's uh, let's go with a wonderful Roxanne Riskin from Connecticut, longtime friend of the program, just a great friend. Uh, welcome, Roxanne. I, I think you're muted. Thank you for having me. There you uh, go. My question relates to what your quote is, the risk of bifurcation in the research enterprise. Can you discuss that more? Because I find that totally intriguing and keeping in mind what you just said, the affordability by um, our students who really can't afford a higher education uh, and how that post-secondary degree that you're, I'm, I'm kind of reading from what you wrote because it's so fascinating. How will we make that more affordable for our lower income families to be able to afford um, college universities? Thank you, Roxanne. Yeah, so I, I, I do think that, um, so I, I'd like to address this in a, in a couple ways. So first, just the broader question of, of affordability for you know, the post-secondary experience and degree. I mean, I do think that it's going to be important we identify ways to use technology smartly uh, to reach uh, more students and therefore spread the cost of the infrastructure of more students uh, as a way to, to make it uh, less expensive. Cost, and I mean that from a cost point of view, not the price or tuition, but less, less expensive per student on a on a cost basis. That's that's one of our challenges to figure out how to do that. The only way to do that is if you actually have more students that you need to teach or you reduce your costs themselves, but there's a limit to how much you can do that, right? You gotta pay the faculty and you have to have infrastructure costs. So so I think that's, that's one big part, one big uh, aspect of the potential for a solution there is, is being uh, creative in the use of when things really require a person in front of a small group of people and when some other things can be used to, to teach students. Um, and I'm not saying that there's, you know, you can replace a faculty. Uh, it's just using uh, uh, the faculty's uh, 
schools at their highest level at the area of, of what what we'd call comparative advantage. So I think that's that's one big question uh, that that I think is an opportunity uh, uh, for for us. I want to I want to touch base on on the, the research side of this because um, and specifically um, how how research is being affected by by computers and by data. Uh, for a moment, because I think we, we see the same risk of a bell ba- a barbell problem coming, uh, or a or a ninety nine point nine percent versus one point oh one percent problem. Uh, increasingly, so there's a whole bunch of fields that kind of, you know, they keep they keep getting narrower and narrower because there's like not really n- new ways to have new unique knowledge, right? Certain fields have gotten narrow, and then all of a sudden, this opportunity to um, use mach- uh, machines to process data to ask questions you could never ask before. It sort of like opens another door, like a whole nother area. So it, it started in, in, in STM related fields, you know, where, you know, all of a sudden you had these huge data sets and, 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 and you could ask a set of questions you never were able to ask before. And all of a sudden the field is, is bigger again in a way. There's like more questions to ask, more work to do, more things to do. So that is, that is going to happen all across all the disciplines, right? We you know, those who are so, you know, digital humanities people already believe that, but it's not going to just be in the STM, it's the social sciences. And, you know, we, we all see that and we all see that coming. So these questions around data, uh, at some level, these data that you use to either train the machines or you, you feed them into a, a machine that you process and think about and analyze at a different level, create this new knowledge. There, there are obviously skills and capabilities and, and you have to get the data itself to be able to do this. Well, first order is the data, and, and, and you could argue that in that environment, I, I made this point in the paper, the data are like a library in the like last century uh, or the century before, right? Uh, institutions gathered around the books or they were built around the content and, and faculty and students, you know, like a watering hole, like they go around that content and they, and they built knowledge off that content. And, and, you know, libraries would, 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 uh, measure themselves based on the number of volumes in the library and institutions would measure, measure themselves that way. What I'm saying is that in some of these fields, like having access to the data is like that, the data, are the watering hole. And, and so if you don't have control or don't have access to those data, you can't do that kind of work. So uh, how do I get this huge Twitter data set? Or how do I get this huge data set that, that Facebook holds and nobody else holds. Um, it, now, what's happening is that the big universities, the big research universities that have huge endowments and resources, they're 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 even struggling actually to get those data because they're held in proprietary places. They're also right. struggling to retain faculty. They're having to do joint appointments with some faculty, with joint appointment with Google, or joint appointment with, so that those folks can get access to those algorithms and those data to ask those mm-hmm. questions. Or, you know, they're having to compete and try to retain faculty and not have them go to those places. So there's that kind of challenge. So one big sort of collective action question is, can the higher education sector get access to those data in a way that's non-competitive with those enterprises, but that could be available for public-oriented research work, right? You know, is there some way that you could recreate this library of data that I'm talking about that, that folks could use? Unfortunately, it's like a colossally huge problem, um, but that's one one way of thinking about it. The other thing that's really starting to happen is that if I'm a faculty member in one of these fields, like I'm an expert in that discipline. I'm not an expert in data science. I don't I don't know how to program in R. I don't know what a Jupyter notebook is or any of those types of things. How do I get help now? Increasingly, these institutions, some of them, very small number of them, are creating little teams, right, that are helping their faculty go get data, they have some, they license some data or go get public data sets, pull them down, help the faculty um, uh, clean up that data, structure that data, et cetera. Hugely expensive undertaking being taken on by these big institutions. Mm-hmm. Only some very small percentage of places is gonna be able to do that. And so if we don't, if we don't figure out ways to share those, those capabilities, those data across lots of different institutions, most faculty, most students, most people will never have an opportunity to do this kind of work. And that drives this question of 1% or 0.1% versus 
into the research enterprise as well. Now, you could argue that that's always been the case, that some places have more research than others, but I think we should be aiming for something uh, more distributed. Well, Roxanne, what a fantastic question. That was phenomenal. Thank you. I, it really is that 1% that has access to all of that elite data. I call it elite data because mm. if we can't access it, it is elite. It's just available to certain, certain yeah. places. Uh, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was wonderful. Well, and I think the, the real risk is that it's not going to be available to higher ed at all, even even to the even to the one percent. You know that it'll be it'll be the it'll be the uh, in control of the of the commercial enterprises, um, and that's you know that that would be that would be a big change to where we've been for you know the last couple of centuries. That'd be a big shift. Um, we have another uh, question, and this is coming from another special person. This is from Steve Gottlieb, the founder, creator, and CEO of Shindig. Welcome, Steve. Um, hey, Brian. Great to see you. And, and uh, Kevin, great to see you again. Uh, I, 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 you know, it's the first time I've gotten a chance to use Shindig, so I'm, 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 I'm loving it. It's really great. Oh, cool. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so excited. Um, so, um, there was a conversation going on in uh, in the audience, um, and I'll try to make steer this so it's not uh, shindig related. But it was kind of uh, bemoaning the fact that aren't the faculty, you know, part of the uh, the roadblock to uh, institutional innovation? And uh, look, in my experience, trying to get shindig adopted and I don't think it, uh, by institutions and I don't think it's different from other tech companies, you know, it's not just the faculty, it's everyone, you know, it's the institution, it's the board, it's, uh, it's the students, it's the faculty. And it made me think that where are the actual incentives, uh, to drive anyone to innovate? Um, and is that part of, uh, is that part of the problem that um, the the benefits are so long term and the threats to change uh, so profound um, that uh, it's a real problem that no one really has much incentive uh, to do anything other than continue along the way and bear the consequences and look out for one's own self-interest, which which actually then led me to my part B of the question. Could you ever imagine faculty banding together and using technology and saying, we're going to strike out on our own. We're the real value add. We're going to create our own online ins uh, institution uh, and uh, that's really lean and, and completely virtual. Um, and we'll be the, the uh, kind of pioneers of this new future uh, that's really uh, – uh, innovating. So uh, the A and B question. Awesome question, Steve. Yeah. So, uh, so how many employees are at Shindig now? Like a dozen. Okay. So, uh, yeah, those are fun times. Uh, so one thing I will say is like, you know, I think people, uh, say, Oh, aren't, aren't faculty part of the faculty, the problem or part of the problem. One thing I will say now, having had experience of an organization that's grown and we're not very big, but we're about 370 people that my answer to the question would be, yeah, absolutely. Faculty are, par are part of the problem. And so are employees at every company in every, you know, sector in the, on the planet, right? Uh, you, you go and you try to change something in an organization in a dramatic way. Um, you know, if you're over about, I don't know, 20, if you can't get people in the room and say, this is what we're going to do, it's really hard. So I think that's, I think there is uh, that resistance. I think that the, the, the special thing about faculty is this this notion that they are really um, almost free agents kind of within an institutional environment, right? And, you know, a lot of people talk about the faculty identifying more with their discipline than when their institution. Um, there's those, those aspects, that their professional life and their professional rewards come from their work and not from their, you know, contribution to some collective whole of the institution, right? They care about their institution. It sends their paychecks. They have some pride around it, et cetera. But at some level, their primary, a lot of, a lot, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of unfairly focusing, I think, a little bit on research faculty here, but, um, but I, I don't think it's really so, I mean, I think there are many, many, obviously, zillions of faculty, you're incredibly committed to the students and incredibly committed to 
uh, to 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 the values of of higher ed. Uh, but I think that they some of the provisions which are 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 not as institutionally oriented are what create some of this this challenge. So what I would say is that I, I agree with you. The incentives are, are, are problematic because I think most of the incentives for faculty are individualized. I mean, you know, they just are. You, 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 don't, you don't really get, you get rewarded by your individual work. I mean, you do collaborative work in certain fields and all that, but you get, you get rewarded for your individual work. And, you know, your, your staff at Shindig, you're going to reward some of them for individual work, but it's really about how the company does. And I think that's, I think that's one fundamental difference. And I think in that environment, you have to appeal to the, to the, to the values. I mean, I think when the institutions or the values come under threat, and I think we're seeing that, um, I do think that the institutions can respond. And there are, there are good, in, there are institutions that are, that are doing a variety of things that are unusual. You know, I mean, Georgia Tech's master's degree in computer science for $7,000. I mean, People are stepping up to try to figure out ways to do things in a really different way to make that possible. And, you know, what's their incentive to do so? I mean, it's not, there's not really an obvious incentive there, but uh, other than, than they want to teach more students and, and, and be affordable. And, you know, I think there are a lot of examples like that. I just think that there's a lot of inertia in any organization and, uh, and more in the higher ed space because faculty are fundamentally um, individualized. Uh, so I, I do think that um, I do think that there, you know, th in the earlier part of this conversation, I was expressing some frustration at our inability to see higher ed, uh, you know, make more of adaptive learning, and and that's that's consistent with what you're saying and your frustrations uh, there. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that people are seeing the threats, though. I mean, when you start seeing colleges go out of business, you start seeing you know reductions in enrollment. I, I think people are seeing you know, if you will, the cliff. And, uh, and I think that, that, you know, these have been evolving institutions and I think they can move a little faster when they see, you know, see the real threats. Fear is a good motivator. Uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for a great question. And thank you for shindig. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, I hate to say this, but we have rocketed through the hour and we are out of time. Uh, Kevin, Thank you so much for just sharing a, a real torrent of ideas and analyses about higher education. I mean, you're a fantastic guru in this. Let me let me ask, um, how can people keep up with you? What's what are the best ways? Well, I, you know, it's uh, you know, email is probably the best way. I mean, I, I I am constantly being chastised by my colleagues and friends for my pathetic Twitter. Uh, uh, <laughs> or social media presence is uh, for whatever reason, it's not something I've been very good at. Uh, so, you know, I can't, if I say follow me on Twitter, you'll be very disappointed unless you like just looking at, you know, something static. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, shoot me emails. Um, you know, we our, our Ithaca SNR website, you know, we put out blog posts that uh, there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think, you know, trying to try, you know, I'll, I'm going to try to do a little bit more. Uh, like I said, and my colleagues encouraged me to, you know, push me out the door a little bit more than I do. Uh, so, but I think Ithaca SNR's website is, is a place where you see blogs and, and things like that and, and issue, issue briefs. Uh, but if yeah. you're interested in, in chatting with me, just shoot me an email and, and I'll respond. Well, that's very kind of you. Um, and uh, please My let me... Just is very simple. Just You can just use kg at Ithaca.org. Easy peasy. Um, yep. Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this and I'm, I really admire your work. Thank you very much. Oh, my, my pleasure. I, I'm honored that you asked me to be on it, and it was, it was fun, and I appreciate everybody, uh, everybody showing up. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, but don't leave anyone yet. We still have to introduce next week's guest. Uh, so next week, we're going to have uh, shift ground a little bit to invite the wonderful Kathleen Fitzpatrick from Michigan State. Uh, she is the author of a new book about generous thinking in higher education. She is asking us humbly to reconceive how we think about colleges and universities. Uh, it's a moving and powerful book, which you can get from our bookstore. And Kathleen is a raving genius, just one of the most important people you can listen to. Please uh, join us next week for uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick and Generous Thinking in Higher Education. Um, also next week, we'll be finishing up our reading of Shoshana, Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, which is an extraordinary book. It's a book that you're seeing cited everywhere from Congress to business to the media. Uh, we're just wrapping this up right now. 
The whole series of blog posts and discussions are there for you. So please join us at the end or join us when you can. Uh, if you want to grab a copy of that or a copy of uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick's book or any other book on the future of education and technology, head to our bookstore. It's the only one of its kind on the web. And if you want to keep all the conversations going between bouts of video discussion, we have lots of social media sites. We have groups on Slack, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. A bunch of us are on Twitter. Um, please follow us so we can keep the conversation going. In the meantime, thank you, friends, today for terrific questions, a great conversation. I really appreciate this all. We'll see you next time. Thanks again. Bye-bye.